Last week we looked at, and I told, I was telling Shelby, told Kara earlier that when I, I agreed to split this class up with Shelby that I didn't even realize it till just recently that last week and this week are two of my, two of my favorite scenes in scripture. And so it was, it was a blessing last week to be able to look at the, the blind man and Jesus uh, sending the blind man to the pool of Siloam to rinse the spit mud off his eyes and to be healed. And what an amazing situation all that was. We're going to be looking in John chapter 11 tonight. Um, how many of you in here were born from 1990 on? A whole clump right here. And <laughs> Steve, careful. <laughs> no, I didn't say 1890. <laughs> so, 1991, about 9091, is what is considered the end of the Cold War. So those of you who were born post-90, you didn't get to live through that time. You just go back and read Tom Clancy novels. They'll tell you the whole story. But it, 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 it ended with the collapse of the Soviet Union. started right after World War II when the Soviet Union saw this vacuum of power that the Germans had left. So it became this back-and-forth tension between the Soviet countries, the Soviet bloc, there's always kind of use that term, and the Western world. Uh, started uh, with, went, with, with the Soviet Union's beginnings of aggression, the Western countries started NATO, and then the, the communists moved into China, and then moved into North Korea, which began the Korean conflict, which went, runs from like 50 to 53, somewhere in that area. And through the years, it, it just, it's back and forth between these two groups. You get into the 60s. In 1961, the Soviets start moving missiles into Cuba and the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, very intense meeting with, with Kennedy and Khrushchev. I was reading an article about that today. It's very, very interesting. Kennedy was so unprepared and somehow came out of it all right. It's, it's amazing. It's a scary time. It's very, very interesting to me since we never did what everybody was afraid was going to happen. Everything blow up. But, but it, it's very interesting because it goes, then it, it goes from there. It goes to, of course, Vietnam. And then you can move up through the, the Soviet, uh, let me use that word, the Soviet military movements into Hungary, into Czechoslovakia, and into Afghanistan, even in the late 70s. Of course, we were involved with... Uh, it, overthrowing a leftist rule in Guatemala in 54, 55. So it, it was always this group would do one thing, then this group would do something. And luckily, like I said, we never got to the point where it all blew up. You know, we, we, we went back and forth with somebody would make a move and then somebody else would either, we'd have to back down or figure out a way to work through this. The These political times, that's, that's, that's how it was, that... One side would make a move and the ten tensions would increase. And the other side, we'd either have to counter or would have to figure out a way to solve it or everything. I mean, literally then, everything would have just blown up. That's kind of the situation politically we're in in John chapter 11 with Jesus and the Pharisees. As we saw last week with the healing of the blind man, just couple chapters earlier, even chronologically, not too much earlier than, than where we are now. The Pharisees just did not like the fact that Jesus was, was healing, was doing these things, was doing these things in public. All, all the different tension about this. Well, when we get into chapter 10, the end of chapter 10, kind of skipping over a little bit of that situation there in chapter 10. But you get to look at chapter 10, beginning in verse 22. It says, then, to the festival of, then the festival of dedication took place in Jerusalem, and it was winter. Jesus was walking in the temple in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews surrounded him and asked, How long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. Skip down to verse 31. There they've just surrounded him. Verse 31, again, the Jews picked up rocks to stone him. Verse 39, then they were trying again to seize him, but he eluded their grasp. You can see the tension building in this conflict between Jesus and the, uh, the, the, the Jewish leaders. In our encounter, we're going to look at tonight 
Jesus is going to again escalate the tension, not just to be spiteful, but I, I, I believe he knows the tension is escalating. I think we can see that in, in everything that goes on here. But things are coming to a political, if you will, boiling point. Uh, if, if you've never really read the politics around Jesus in his day, it's, it's, it's incredibly interesting. It, it really adds another layer to understanding what Jesus was dealing with, what the early church was dealing with. But where he is right now, again, it's, it's said there in, in chapter 10, verse 22, that it was winter. This is the last winter of Jesus' life. As, as this winter ends, moves into spring, that's when his betrayal and crucifixion and all that stuff will take place. <clears throat> but in chapter 11, verse 25, in the middle of this scene, Jesus says these words, that I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, he will live. So he makes a bold statement. I'm the resurrection and life. But look back at chapter 5, or just, just listen to me read chapter 5, verse 21. You can look if you want to. Chapter 5, verse 21, he says, And just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so, also, so the Son also gives life to whom he wants. That was really in John's gospel, Jesus' first time to make this claim that he gives life. And when he, when he says this here in John chapter 11, it's shocking, but it really shouldn't have been. Has this ever happened before with Jesus? What's going to happen here in chapter 11? Yeah, he's raised the widow of Nain's son, Jairus' daughter. I mean, this, uh, Peter's mother-in-law is more than likely re very, fairly, fairly close to this time. So this isn't new. People should have known this. And some people did, but here's the problem with what happens in chapter 11. This all happens in Bethany. Bethany is right next to Jerusalem. It's way too close to home. It's way too close for the Jewish leaders to have all this noise, all this talk about who Jesus is. And like I said, we, you, you read through chapter 11 into chapter 12. It is so plain that this, this is the tipping point for the Jewish leaders. <clears throat> Uh, look at chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. We're, we're going to read through a lot of this, but stay right here in chapter 11 because we're not going anywhere else. But we are going to read a lot of this. Verse 1, Now a man was sick, Lazarus from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair, and it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. Okay, when did that happen? It's the next chapter, but he's writing about it in past tense because he's writing about it 40 years later. So people know that this is who she is. So even though it hasn't happened in his writing yet, he's writing about it in past tense because it was past tense. Is that confusing enough? He's writing, he's saying, you all, you all know who Mary is because she's the one that anointed his, his feet. Now, this is not, what, what he's saying is that you people know this from Matthew's gospel and from Luke's, or from Mark's gospel. This is not Luke's, Luke chapter 7, anointing the feet with oil. That's at Simon the Pharisee's house. This is at Simon, somebody else's house. This is at, well, this, Simon the leper is what Mark or Matthew says, possibly is Mary and Martha and Lazarus' dad. But anyway, this is, this is not the same setting as the sinful woman, okay? Let's just establish that. Now, Look down to verses 3 through 6. <clears throat> so the sis sisters sent a message to him. Lord, the one you love is sick. When Jesus heard it, he said, This sickness will not end in death, but it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. <laughs> That's not how that verse <laughs> should end, right? That it doesn't, doesn't quite flow with how we think of things. But <clears throat> this is very similar language to what we saw last week. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll press on in this and uh, kind of tear, tear this situation apart a little bit. Let's, let's bow together. <clears throat> God, our Father, we thank you so much for this evening. Thank you for this time that we can be here together to fellowship with one another, to spend time and study. God, I thank you so much for this this recording of this incredible event we're about to look at. God, the, 
the, the power that we see in your son, the impact that he had on the people around him. And as we, we've looked at these different encounters, God, we, we we're able to see people's eyes opened and some people's eyes closed. And I just pray that you will help us as we as we study this event tonight, as we study throughout throughout your word at, at any time. I pray that we will we will study with our eyes open and that we will be willing to learn and to listen what, what you want us to, 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 to learn and to, to come to know about you and your son. Pray that you'll bless each class, each student here tonight. Pray that you will help us to, to learn. Pray that you will help us most of all to be honoring and glorifying to you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so verse 4. Look at verse 4. What does that language remind you of? Yeah, what, what the, the, it's almost the same thing he said about the blind man, that this man, neither his mother, neither him or his parents sinned, but this is, he's this way so that God will be glorified. He says the same thing here about, <clears throat> about Lazarus. Now, again, same idea. We have to understand that in chapter 9, God didn't make that guy blind. And same thing here, God isn't killing Lazarus to allow Jesus to make a point. However... I do think it's fair to say that Jesus allows Lazarus to die. Because, I mean, it just says he loves these people so much and it was so terrible and he stayed two days where he was. Now, but think about this. Could he have just said, okay, Lazarus, he's better? Sure, he could have done that too. We've seen him, we've seen him heal from a distance. So there's, there's more to this than just, well, he stayed for a little while or whatever. There's... <clears throat> There's a, uh, there's, there's a reason for everything Jesus does. And like I said, I, I, I think we can see it as we go through here. Jesus says that this is going to be something that brings God glory. Look at verses 7 and 8. You can kind of see this, this tension we've been talking about here. Then after that, he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again after they stayed for two days. Rabbi, the disciples told him, just now the Jews tried to stone you and you're going to go there again. So even those closest to him are like, man, you should not go back there. Because where, where he's been, let's click back here. Where he has been is, hey, hey, work with me. Is somewhere over here, it says that he went beyond the Jordan to where John was baptizing. So really, if, if you're right in here to get to Bethany, it's, it's not a four days journey. So the, he delayed on purpose for, for reasons that we'll see. <clears throat> Now, skip down. Well, so, so even, even his, his disciples are saying, don't go back there. They, you, they just tried to kill you. Well, that's what we just saw at the end of chapter 10. So they get it. They're like, man, that's, that's the wrong place for you to be. But Jesus has to know what he's about to go do. So he's like, yep, it's time to go back to Judea. Now, look down to verse 11. Verse 11 through 16. <clears throat> he said this, and then he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But I'm on my way to wake him up. Then the disciples said to him, uh, Lord, if he's falling asleep, he'll get well. They're, they're thinking, well, that's what he needs, some good rest. He'll be fine. And Jesus, however, was speaking about his death, but they thought he was speaking about natural sleep. So Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. I'm glad for you that I wasn't there so that you may believe. But let's go to him. Now look at verse 16. Then Thomas called the twin said to his fellow disciples, let's go too so that we may die with him. Who is this guy? Who is Thomas? Yeah, do we, do we ever call him brave Thomas? Ready to die Thomas? No, he's stuck with doubting Thomas. But right here he's going, let's go do this. If, if he's going to Jerusalem, so are we. And we'll, we'll be right there by his side until we all run off at the end. But at this point... This is looking pretty good for Mr. Doubting Thomas. I mean, he's, he's showing some courage. He's, and, and you also see that he understands this is going to be a bad situation. If we go back in there and he does something, I mean, Jesus, Jesus even said <clears throat> that I'm, I'm going to make him well. I'm, I'm going to wake him up. I'm glad, I'm glad that I wasn't there so that you may believe. That's an incredible statement. because These guys should have seen all this stuff. But he's saying this is so important this is going to be so impactful that it's going to change the way you guys think. And Thomas goes, all right, let's go. Let's, let's go do what we have to do. It's, it's, it's an amazing situation. <clears throat> all of this is kind of the buildup. 
You know, if, 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 if this is a movie, this is like the first 10, 15 minutes. It's really building the tension. That's, that's pointing toward where we're actually going. Skip down to verse 17. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, less than two miles away. Now, this four days thing is going to be repeated again. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but we also see John gives us this, this right, reminder or whatever that Bethany is very close to Jerusalem. That will help to explain some of the crowds. That there's obviously going to be a bunch of people who are, who are around them mourning. Uh, but he says, you know, it's, it's less than two miles away. It's a 30-minute walk. So there's friends from Jerusalem. They, they, they kind of live out in the country. You know, they're in... You know, they're in Star or Middleton. They're coming to Nampa, Boise, Meridian, whatever. So he's saying what, what John tells us is this is the reason there's a crowd of people. This is the reason that, there is, that there's going to be this crowd that we're going to see. Pick up in verse 19. Many of the Jews had come to Mary and Martha, Martha and Mary to comfort, comfort them about their brother. As soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Yet even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Your brother will rise again, Jesus told her. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Who's sitting in the house now? Mary. Mary. Again, all we have, you know, we have the big picture of Martha being the one that's, you know, the, the busy about the wrong things. Here she's the one out talking to Jesus. She's the one that's come out to, to meet him or whatever, however it all worked out. But it's interesting with Mary or Martha. <clears throat> Jesus says, your brother will be made well. And she says, I know that... If, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Yet now, yet even now, I know that you will, whatever you ask from God, he, he will give you. What, is, what do you think she's saying there? Do you think she's saying, if you want to raise him from the dead, raise him from the dead? It seems like it, but then her next state, statement seems like that's not what she means. So that's, that to me is one of those kind of confusing statements there because he goes, he goes well, your, your brother will live again will rise again. She goes, well, I know that he'll live again in the resurrection. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. Yeah, what, what Dana's saying that this seems fitting with her character that in her her other scene that we're so familiar with. She's worried about the dinner, making sure everything's taken care of. Here, maybe it, it seems like she's kind of, you know, dotting all, the, dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's. She's making sure, yeah, I know the resurrection thing, but what about right now? So she is in, in many ways showing great faith. The fact that, that she's there ready to deal with this. Uh, chances are this burial place is outside of town. So maybe, maybe she was already there and just she happened to be the one at the tomb while Mary was at home with the guests or whatever. But she, she seems to have, I don't know, I, I even have in my notes, and I wrestle with this a lot today. I have in my notes, she seems to have no notion of him raising Lazarus at that point. But she kind of does seem like it. It almost kind of seems like she's saying, whatever you want to do, do. I'm good with it. Yeah, kind of. It, it, Linda said it seems like she doesn't get it. And, it's, and, it, and it kind of seems like a little bit of both. But look at what she said. In, look at 26 and 27. This, this is a great statement she makes here. <clears throat> everyone who lives, Jesus says, everyone who lives and believes in this, believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? 27, she says, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God who comes into the world. Now, in that sentence, she makes five amazing statements. Four explicit, one that's kind of, kind of there. She says she calls him Lord. So that's an acknowledgement of his lordship. Then she calls him the Christ. 
She says that, that, that you're, you're the Messiah. You're the one that we've been waiting for. Then she gives him the son of God title. So, I mean, she's just laying it on him here. And then she says that you're the one sent into the world. That's, that's an old Jewish notion of God's going to send somebody to us. God's going to send this prophet to us. So she goes bang, 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 bang. All these great things about who Jesus is. But also in that, she's also kind of confirming him as this great teacher, this great rabbi. The Jewish rabbis didn't teach women. They taught the men. So he's standing there teaching her, her something. And, and she's like, yes, Lord, I get it. I get who you are. So her statement is just an incredible statement. Now, verse 28 <clears throat> would be on the next page. Having said this, she went back and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and he's calling for you. As soon as Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Jesus had not yet come into the village, but he was still in the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw that Mary got up quickly and went out. They followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to cry there. Okay, again, this is one of those situations that you kind of have to do some extra reading about. In the Jewish culture, they had these people who were literally considered professional mourners. That if, you know, if there was a tragedy in your family, like in this, in this situation, they would come and they'd just hang around and they'd mourn with you. And I, mean, I don't mean professional like they're paid. It was, it was what they did, that they were like a mourning committee or something, that they would, they'd show up at your house and they'd stay there and mourn with you. I, and I don't mean that flippantly. It's a good thing. Like I said, this is one of those times where we're kind of seeing some of these Jews in a positive light, and when a lot of times we don't. <clears throat> but they are, they're coming from their house out to the burial site, out to the tomb. And Jesus seems to be intentionally staying away from the crowd because you get the impression from what Martha said that Jesus said, I'm not going to go to the house. You go get her and send her out here because he knows there's a crowd there. So considering the tension, considering the fact that it seems like Jesus is purposely kind of staying away a little bit, this is where this all gets very interesting to me. Now, some of you, some of you have probably heard, that, heard me talk about this before. I have a little different perspective of what we're about to see than some people do. I'm not saying, well, we'll talk about it. I'll just tell you when we get there. Uh, Look at verse 33. <clears throat> Where'd it go? Mary says the same thing. If you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Verse 32. Verse 33. When Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you put him? He asked. Lord, they told him, come and see. Jesus wept. Okay. Okay. Again, this is one of those times where we see the Jews painted in a pretty, pretty good way because they're there with her. They're, they're consoling the sisters. This is a tough situation for them to have to deal with. And they're, they're there. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're weeping with the sisters. They're mourning where they should be mourning. And then it says Jesus also weeps. But let's look at this a little bit. Because this is something I think is, is one of those things that it, it's easy just to kind of read and go, well, of course he cried. But it, again, this is one of those things that if, if you do a little digging into it, this is pretty interesting. When he sees these people weeping, when he sees this, uh, this crowd coming and they're crying, the sisters are crying, the word that's used there is the word kleuson. It's, it would be spelled K-L-A-I-O-U-S-O-N. That's the Greek spelling in English. But it's, it's a word that means to weep or to lament or to have great sorrow. It's, it's what he sees them doing. They're, they're coming out and they're all upset and it's wailing and weeping. And this is, this is a word used 40 times in the New Testament. Uh, this is Romans 12, 5. Weep with those who weep. That's, that's this word. It's when somebody's in sorrow, be in sorrow with them. <clears throat> but when Jesus sees this, the... the Christian Standard Bible uses the expression, he was moved in his spirit. What do other translations say? Moved. 
indignant, deeply moved. Somebody say groaned, troubled in spirit. Okay, so he sees these people coming and they're all weeping. And the first word we see is a word that really is kind of difficult to translate, but it's a word that means displeasure or indignant or, or even anger. In fact, the CS, CSB's footnote says, or angry. So Jesus sees, sees this and he's like, so his, his first, the first emotion that, that we see is this indignant idea. It also can mean to be emotionally stirred. Wait, let me catch up with myself here. Yeah, anger or displeasure or just being emotionally stirred up. Then that, that other word says that he was uh, it go? moved in his spirit and deeply troubled. That's this idea of being agitated. So he sees this crowd coming, all upset and weeping. And then the next thing we see is Jesus wept. Part of this, in my opinion, part of this shows a great deal of humanity from Jesus. It, it shows compassion. Now, here's, here's, what I, here's what I'll tell you. It seems like we read this to just be Jesus saw the people being sad and was compassionate with the sisters, and he was sad too. And he was all upset, and it was, it was tough to watch. I don't doubt that at all, but I think there's more to it than him just going, oh, this is so sad. Th this is, this is a, a, a situation... Again, consider the fact that he's just been run out of Jerusalem because they tried to stone him. They tried to surround him. They, I mean, the things, are, things are tense. He leaves, finds out his friend's sick and is dying, waits, comes back. His own closest friends go, dude, don't go. we don't need to go back there. That's not the place to go. He gets there and sees this emotional scene, and he is troubled. He's bothered by all of this. So let's, let's think. He sees this crowd coming. He sees all the weeping. And he is troubled. He is stirred up. He's shaken. He's agitated. How many of you have siblings? How many have older siblings? I had... I had two of the meanest sisters in the whole world. <clears throat> I had two sisters. <laughs> it's going to be rewound. Uh, and I had an older brother, but he was, he, was moved, he was out before I even got very old at all. But my sisters had this thing where it was so funny to tickle a little brother. Have you ever been tickled so much that it's like, this is not funny anymore? That you want to just bludgeon people? Well, there were times where you were you know, being picked on by my one sister in particular. I won't say which one. But it wouldn't be that big of a deal but you just get so angry and you're not really sad. You're not really emotional, but you all of a sudden you have tears. I remember, <laughs> I, remember and I think I've shared this with you before. I remember my, my highlight of my sports life was I had, a, I had one really, really good run in football that I went 60 yards, juked out some people. I was going to score and I fumbled. And I, again, I wasn't sad. I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't like, oh, I mean, I was angry and I was, in, I was in tears. Have you ever felt that feeling? I think that's what Jesus is feeling here. Just that. Oh. Yeah, just what, what is wrong with you people? Okay, so, and in verse 35, of course, he weeps. Now, let's talk about this word. The other word, that these people weeping, sad people, 40 times. The word here is this word, dacruo. And it means to burst into almost, I mean, it, it implies accidental tears. One time. This is the only time this, this word is used in the New Testament. It's the only time. And it seems like what's happening here is Jesus, yes, he's moved. Yes, I, I, I believe he has compassion. But I think this is more of just frustration. Just, and let me tell you why. Let me give you my reasons for that. I, again, I'm not discounting sympathy. If you think it's sympathy and compassion, I'm by no means saying you're wrong. I just think there's more to it. Where's Lazarus right now? Huh? Where's, where's Lazarus right now? He's in paradise. 
when Saul calls back Samuel, Samuel says to Saul, why'd you bother me? Jesus knows that. Jesus knows that not only was his good friend Lazarus sick and died, what's going to happen again? He's going to get sick and die again someday. And Jesus probably knows what we'll see at the end of this is that Lazarus is going to be this, going from this nobody that lives in Bethany to somebody the Jewish leaders hate. And then he has to see this crowd who's going, I have to do this so you people will believe. And I think it's frustrating. Yes, I think it's sad. I think it's compassion. But I think it's just, this is what I have to do. This is the links I have to go. And you even see it in his prayer, April. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, and, and again, it's like Jesus knows what he's going to do. I mean, if, if, if I'm afraid that if I were Jesus and I saw these people sad, I'd be going, hey, 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 no, listen, Lazarus, come out. Look, there he is. And just solve it. But Jesus knows it's more than that, that there's a lot more going on here. So when, when, he, when he sees this pain and he sees the sadness from these people, but then knows that they're going to have to do this all over again because of what he's about to do. I think he's to the point where he, he's dealing with a different emotion. And I love that picture because I, I, I think that picture fits the language that's actually used there more than just Jesus wept. I mean, and again, I'm not saying it's not sympathy or compassion or whatever, but I, use, based on the actual language that's there, there's more to it. And the people even say, look how much he loved him. And it's, it's cool because the word that they use there is phileo. It's, it's a deep brotherly love. It's like this, he's, he's upset because of what's happened with, with Lazarus. Little do they know what he's about to do, though. So, any, any thoughts on that? Anybody want to tell me I'm crazy? Or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm, I, I don't discount just straight up sympathy and compassion, but I think there's another le level to it with, based on these words. Yeah, what, if you didn't hear Shelby, she said, couldn't it just be both? And I, I, I think it is both, but I think it's more than just sadness. Probably. <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> oh, yeah. A absolutely. What Dana is saying is you look at verse 37, and there's people who say, see how much he loved him, and then there's people saying, yeah, but you know, if, isn't this, what does it say? Isn't he opened the blind man's eyes here a while back? Couldn't he have kept this guy from dying? It almost seems like there's a little bit of sarcasm there from the people. Kind of that, uh, oh yeah, it's this guy, the, the blind guy, he, healer. Yeah. Exactly. He's, and that's the, 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 in verse 38, it's the same word. It's that whole. Uh. But what, what you're saying is that. Uh, uh, so I don't remember what you said. They just didn't believe. Yeah, that's, that's what I was saying. Is that, that even Martha, he says, he says, yeah, your brother's going to rise again. And she goes, oh, I know he will in the resurrection. And he's like, I just said he's going to rise again. But, and again, it kind of goes back to what Dana was saying. Maybe she's going, okay, yeah, but right now? Or, I mean, how long do we have to wait for that? Oh, man. Um, okay, so in verse 38, same, same thing. And he goes to the cave. Look at verse 38. <clears throat> then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave. And a stone was lying against it. 
Remove the stone, Jesus said. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, there's already a stench because he has been dead for four days. And again, here's this four-day thing. There is a Jewish belief, it's called Shemira, that the soul stays with the body for three days. There's, or this, there's, Shemira is an act of watching over a dead body. That in their culture, if somebody died, if possible, you'd bury them that day or as soon as possible. Because this, the soul, they said, stuck around the body until it was buried. And the, the, the soul was troubled and couldn't, wasn't sure where to go. Again, nothing biblical about that at all. That's just a Jewish tradition. But Jesus seems to know that. I mean, he would know that because he's a, a Jew in that day. So in, in this, this belief, again, I'll just tell you, this is my opinion. I think that's why he waited for the fourth day. Because by the third day, the, the, the soul's gone. He's, he's dead like Rover. I mean, it's, it's done. So on this fourth, she goes, okay, it's been four days. Now he's really starting, things are starting to get ugly in there. But Jesus says, go ahead and move the stone. Uh, and this is so cool. Verse 41. So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd standing here, I said this, so that they may believe you sent me. And after this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Jesus prays out loud. Okay, the time period, four days. Jesus prays audibly, prays out loud. And he even, even says, I'm just saying this so these people will hear that uh, this is me talking to you. And how, wh what does Jesus say? How does he phrase that about God recognizing what he's saying? I think that you what? Heard me. He says it in past tense. He says, this is a done deal. Lazarus is back. All I got to do is bring him out. So it shows, it shows complete confidence in what God's going to do. He's, he's just going, Father, I'm just saying this. He could have prayed a little quiet prayer to himself. Lazarus, come forth. Same thing. But he says, I'm saying this out loud so they'll, they'll know that this is God doing this. Goes back to what he said at the beginning. This, this, is, this is happening so that God will be glorified. And, and he does it. And he calls forth Lazarus. Oh, man, there's so much cool stuff here. A couple things to think about. This is just total speculation, just things to think about. He says, Lazarus, come forth. Why do you have to say Lazarus' name? Yeah, what, what if he wouldn't, what if he just said, come forth? That every, dead, every dead person, hey, all right. Oh, not, not me. I mean, I don't know. It, it, like I said, that's just, it's interesting. Yeah, going through the motions, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what... What Anita is saying is you can think of the, these mourners putting on the, the morning show, that that kind of relates a little bit back to the Old Testament Jews that just went through all the motions. So, yeah, maybe this, this whole calling out Lazarus, just to remind them, I'm bringing this guy out. Look at what verse 44 says. I love the way this is worded. The dead man came out band, bound hand and foot. Why didn't he just say Lazarus again? He makes it clear, the dead guy. Not just old La this was the guy that was dead. And he comes out bound hand and foot. How did he come out? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe so. But, I mean, custom, you're, they're wrapped. Well, no, he comes out and then Jesus says, take the wraps off. He's out already. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. How in the world this guy, I'm seeing this thing float out. But, okay, here's a couple of lessons out of this. Take things we can take from these wrappings. 
Number one, Jesus isn't going to do what we can do for ourselves. He told them to move the stone. He told them to unwrap him. Faith requires us to act sometimes. It, it, it may be, I don't know if this is uncomfortable, but we, we have to act on our own sometimes. We have to act in faith. If I'd have been there and they said, move the stone, I'd have been like, mm -mm, I'm not moving the four-day dead, four dead guy's stone. But we also can take from this that Jesus does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Lazarus was not going to raise himself. Lazarus wasn't coming back from the dead. Jesus wasn't giving these sisters their brother back. Or Lazarus wasn't going to give himself back to his sister. Jesus had to do that. Same thing with us. We have sin problem that we can't do anything about without Jesus. So the, the wrap up with this, the Jewish leaders, this man works many signs. What are we going to do? We got to get rid of this guy. They don't deny it. They don't deny he just brought this guy back from the dead. They just hate him. And then Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, and there's a, there's a great thing about that too, but he says, it's better that one man should die or else we lose our nation and our place. He doesn't know how right he is. And John even says that. He's, he's basically making a prophecy. Yes, one man's going to die for everybody. And then people coming to see Jesus, coming to see this, and they're choosing to believe. But then in Chapter 12, verse 9, the Pharisees say we got to kill Lazarus too. And again, I think Jesus knew that would happen. So what we, what we skipped over is chapter 12, verse 1 through 8. That's when Mary anoints his feet with oil. And I think it's a response to what he did for her and her family, raising her brother, giving their support back to him. It's, it, this this whole, whole thing is amazing. We, I, I, I could spend weeks on this. And any thoughts, because we don't have any time at all. Much less, much less weeks. Anything? Okay. All right. Shelby is back with you next week.